Um, good evening, everybody, and welcome to another uh, Daily Maverick webinar. Uh, this evening, we have an hour to discuss the question of COVID-19 and human rights, and are we doing the right thing? I think it's going to be a fascinating and important discussion, but before we get into the discussion, I think it's very important to just uh, spend a minute to pass condolences to the family of Babita Diokoran, uh, who was an official who worked in the health department in Gauteng, who yesterday was gunned down uh, mercilessly outside her home uh, as a result of her role in uh, reporting and exposing COVID-19 and other corruption within the Gauteng health department. So I just ask you to think of uh, Babita for for a few seconds and to join the dots between corruption and theft of public resources and the subject that we're going to be talking about this evening, which is human rights and our ability to, hum to realize human rights. And one thing I can say for certain is that there's no hope of realizing the right to healthcare if we don't have honest public servants who protect the public purse and make sure that money goes to those who need it the most. So we salute you, uh, Babita, and we hope for justice, uh, swift justice for the people who brought about your, your, your murder. So as I said, today's webinar is about COVID-19 and human rights. And to discuss this issue, we have, I think, people who are two people who are not just experts, but rock stars in the field of COVID, HIV, infectious disease, health, and human rights. Two unique personalities, people whose lives and careers span the history of not just the COVID pandemic, obviously, but of the HIV epidemic, and who have made huge contributions to how we have responded to, to both epidemics. So I'm extremely pleased to have been able to bring these people, two people together tonight and to ask them to hold a discussion before uh, the six or 700 of you who are already online. I think they're known to you, but first of all, I'd like to introduce Justice Edwin Cameron. Uh, Edwin Cameron, good evening and thank you for being with us. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Justice Cameron, has been a judge for 25 years. He's been an HIV and human rights activist. He's been an activist on LGBTIQ and children's rights issues. He's currently the inspecting judge of prisons and he's the chancellor of Stellenbosch University. So beat that. Uh, but uh, uh, on his right uh, is another very, very distinguished person, uh, Professor Slim. Uh, Salim Abdul Karim. Uh, Slim, good evening. Very good evening, Mark. Good evening, Justice Cameron. Slim has been with us uh, many times before, uh, and it's <laughs> great to have him back. I'll just say that Slim is the director of the Center for AIDS Program of Research in South Africa. He also has a CV that could take all afternoon to read, uh, uh, and he was uh, the chairperson of the Ministerial Advisory Committee on COVID-19. I think that's where many people uh, got to know Slim if, if you didn't know him before. Uh, uh, thank you very much to both of you for, for, for being here. Before I start this evening's conversation, Justice Cameron and, and, and Professor Slim Abdul Karim, I just want to situate, set the scene for our, our, our discussion. We are 18 months into the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, in South Africa officially, there are now 79,000 deaths, but the excess deaths figure is at 238,000. Over the weekend, we heard the first of research that shows that there have been 95,000 children in our country orphaned as a result of COVID-19. And perhaps the only bit of good news that we have is that our vaccination program, which started very sluggishly has at last reached over 10 million, 10.7 million people, I believe, had been vaccinated uh, uh, by yesterday. 
But Edwin and Slim, as I think you will both attest this evening, COVID-19, like HIV, is not just a viral pandemic. What we're seeing increasingly is that it's a pandemic of inequality and a pandemic of human rights abuses. And it's that that I'm going to want you to talk to this evening, but not just to talk to with a view to pointing out the obvious violations, but to talk to with a view to finding the solutions, both to the pandemic, but also to the human rights uh, issues that we face. And to the audience, before I start with uh, Justice Edwin Cameron, I just want to say that we're going to begin our discussion this evening with the general, if you like, but I promise you we're going to move to particular questions which are probably uppermost in your minds, such as should vaccination be mandatory? Can people, uh, should, can people be discriminated if they decline to take vaccination? So we will cover uh, all of this. You're welcome to use the chat to pose questions. I will take as many questions as I can and uh, put them to Slim or to, to Edwin, but I won't be able to, to, to take them all. So that was all by way of introduction. Edwin Cameron, uh, lovely to have you. Edwin, can you just start by talking to us about why human rights are important in the response to any disease or health crisis, or if maybe they're not important, maybe they're not. If they're not, they're not. And, and what should we have learned from the HIV pandemic that, that you and I uh, grew up in, if you like? Thanks, Edwin. Thank you so much, Mark. And what a joy to be here with you. And now I see nearly 800 uh, of our viewers and listeners and, and with Professor Karim. Uh, Mark, I'm going to toss in some more figures, although I know we don't like stats and figures, but I do want to... The reason is, uh, of course, that, that they've not forced anyone to have a vaccine, and that relates to our theme. Uh, there's a lady in, in Grootvlei uh, Correctional Centre, Ms. Patricia Setlai, who is the head of one of the medium centres there, and she has been leading the campaign of education. That takes me straight to your question, Mark. Public health, public welfare, public benefit. It, it is elemental that it is right and correct to use a respectful reproach, uh, approach to, to, uh, to, to containment of an epidemic, to limiting of, of infection and, and, and contagion. And of course, that's because of human dignity and human autonomy and human individuality. Although we've only had the international concept of human rights since 1948 and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, this has been the case through all the previous public health epidemics, including leprosy, cholera, typhoid. But there's a second reason. That, that first reason is the intrinsic one, which is that it's right to respect people when you're trying to say that you are trying to save them from contagion, illness, and death. The second reason is that it works so much better, Mark, and this we, we learned uh, very grievously, but we learned it and we applied it in South Africa. The idea in the AIDS epidemic that there was one perpetrator out there that you had to go and nail, get him, and it was always a him who was spreading HIV. You had to invoke the criminal law, invoke the shackles of the police and, and, and the prison service, it wasn't right. We discovered in the HIV epidemic that human rights protection, human dignity, human autonomy and individuality work best towards con containing the HIV epidemic. And the same is true in COVID. We've had a grievous year for many reasons. Uh, I myself had a very horrible brush with COVID. I'm deeply grateful to uh, an extraordinary fine a pulmonologist, Dr. Mohammed Chohan, who I think saved my life uh, when, when I was uh, emergency hospitalized. And of course, again, like with HIV, that's my privilege, Mark, as, as someone on, 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 on medical protection who had access to that kind of expertise. So when we speak about human rights, we mustn't speak only about the question whether coercion is right or not. Coercion is, is, is what is, we've done in South Africa over the past year. Uh, we've used very coercive methods. We've beat up people. We've killed people. We've driven people from their homes. We've beaten them up in their own front yards. 
Uh, we've made people do push-ups. We've humiliated them. And that's been a terribly wrong approach. But of course, human rights also mark the second dimension of human rights are that we should also have a deep respect for uh, resource deprivation and the epidemic, for equality and for equity in it. So all of the, the, the human rights approaches at both those levels work much better. The opposite approach, which is coercion, inequity, injustice, division, inequality, is deeply counterproductive. Edwin, b b before I, I go on to Slim, when you say it's deeply counterproductive, do you think if our approach had been different, we would have had different outcomes uh, in the way in which we've contained or not contained COVID-19 up to now? And, and, you know, what would you have done differently if you were the Minister of Health uh, or the government? Um, what would your advice have been when it comes to human rights? And from day one, not now, but say we were back on March the 26th, 2020, what would you have, have said to government? I would have said, be careful about using the big stick. There is a role for the big stick, as we said it with AIDS and HIV. If there really is that single, solitary, menacing, evil perpetrator, you should get hold of him, lay hands on him and put, put him in handcuffs. But generally towards the public mark, I would, have, I would have said, keep your big stick away, keep your handcuffs away. Use the resources to train the soldiers that you are sending into the resource-deprived areas, the townships uh, and, and the rural areas. Use those resources to educate the soldiers, to tell people how best to protect themselves and others, Mark. And we could have made, it sounds corny, but it could in fact have worked. We would have done much better. You ask whether it would have made a big difference. I'm not actually sure, Mark, because this epidemic has torn through us in ways that we are finding completely unpredictable. Uh, they hoped in the U.S. to have a, a, a what President Biden called a, a, a free summer, a, an unburdened summer. Well, it's been a nightmare with the Delta variant. So I don't know whether it would have made a difference in terms of contagion, but certainly in terms of people's public trust in government, their public trust in the law and respect for their dignity, it would have made an enormous difference. And I think that we went about it the wrong way to think that we can basically in, in Afrikaans, in high Afrikaans, legal Afrikaans, that you can moor them into line, Mark. And that's the first time on a Daily Maverick <laughs> that the has been used. And we were wrong to, you, to do it, Mark. Did, last thing to you just for the moment, Edwin, because you're mentioning it. Do you think it's too late to turn it round? I mean, we, we've got a long COVID life ahead of us still, haven't we? Uh, um, can we start to do things differently? Definitely, Mark. Nothing is too late. With our crumbling national institutions, with the assault uh, on, on independent institutions, with dysfunction, with Babita Diokaran's death, uh, we've heard that they may be making an arrest early. We hope that is correct. There's nothing that is too late in our country, Mark. And the AIDS epidemic showed that. I want to put in a word both for you as one of the founder members of the Treatment Action Campaign and for Professor Slim Karim and his, and his spouse, Quraysha, uh, Dr. Quraysha Abdul Karim, who uh, in a terrible situation turned it around uh, where we had presidential AIDS denialism, very comparable to, uh, to, to, to vaccine denialism, and we, was, we seem to be in a hopeless situation. We now have, thanks to people like the Treatment Action Campaign, like the, the experts uh, represented this evening by Professor Karim, we have the world's largest publicly provided antiretroviral treatment camp, uh, program. I'm one of nearly 5 million people, Mark, on ALV treatment. And may we say, Mark, this is always an important point to make, this isn't government alone. The ARV treatment program in South Africa is a public-private partnership. There are wonderful uh, uh, pro bono organizations, uh, independent NGOs who are contributing to it. But my point is that there's nothing in our country that is broken that we cannot start fixing today. Thank you very much, Edwin. Well, on that note, I'm going to go over to Slim because you've been, again, very much part of the health responses I think I met Slim slightly a few years after meeting Edwin 
but it was when we were putting together a declaration on the use of antiretroviral medicines in South Africa before uh, before it was official policy to to use those medicines. We called it the Bradell Consensus Statement back in 2002. But Slim, uh, you're a scientist, uh, an epidemiologist. Do, do you agree that human rights have got anything to do with this uh, discussion? Yes, thanks very much, Edwin, for uh, and uh, Mark for having me here. I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Let me just uh, um, start by taking you one step back to a very early stage in my career. The year was 1984-85, and there was an outbreak of measles in northern KwaZulu-Natal. I went up to northern KwaZulu-Natal to investigate this epidemic under the supervision of Professor Jerry Kuvadia. And we went into the houses, we went looking for patients with coplic spots, and we were, we were trying to educate them about the importance of isolating children who have measles, because measles is a highly contagious condition. We then went to the clinic and we had realized the problem is that they didn't even have a working fridge so they couldn't keep the measles vaccine there. And so I began to understand that if we were just going to try and impose mm. a solution without respecting what these people understood, how they appreciated the health service and, and how the health service was not able to fulfill its obligations, I would not have understood this epidemic. And so right from that stage, and I remember when I made some statements about this epidemic, the Minister of Health at that time was somebody called Rina Fenter. I don't know if you remember, this is under apartheid. And Mrs. Rina Fenter sent a message to Jerry and I, we need to come to Parliament to see her and explain to her why this epidemic is occurring. She was, I mean, in that meeting with her, she really wanted to solve the problem. Now, all of this for me was about this was not solving this measles epidemic was not about a medical solution. We have no treatments other than vaccines for prevention. It was about working with people, respecting them and jointly finding solutions. Now, in no other epidemic, and I've been involved in many epidemics, <laughs> in no other epidemic, has the epidemic really been born in the belly of human rights as HIV? Mm -hmm. HIV from its very start was about human rights. It was about people who are vulnerable. The first cases, and I, I go back to you know, my discussions with my colleagues in LA about the first cases they started seeing and the challenges about healthcare personnel wanting, you know, didn't even want to touch them. They were gay men and they had uh, pneumocystis carinia pneumonia. So right from the beginning, HIV and human rights were joined at the hip. And we had no solutions. We knew so little. We didn't even know it was caused by a virus. Remember, Francois Barry Sanusi only described the virus the sources of contagion. And that is why the HIV response right from the beginning, and I remember the discussions with Jonathan Mann, he educated all of us about how human rights and the epidemic response are both you know, sides of the same coin and that they, they go together. You can't do one without the other. And he showed how that with human rights, the response to HIV is so much stronger. And there's no question when you think about it that very early on, even in the US, creating the Ryan White Act, the whole Elizabeth Glazer movement for mother to child transmission, our own efforts to try and get uh, nevirapine for pregnant women, they were fundamentally about human rights issues. And we had to, it's, it's shocking that we had to fight the state to get those elementary things in place. They save lives. 
And even it wasn't even a cost issue. Boringa Ingelheim committed to giving South Africa five years' worth of nevirapine for free. So I learned right at that early stage in my own career that you, you have to look at these in an integrated way. And responses to epidemics are stronger for it. I'll stop there. I mean, I, I could go into a little bit more about how, you know, very early on when we were in New York and working with, uh, you know, the organizations in the U.S. and gay, in the gay community, about all the real challenges they faced, about how they chose to really fight back. And their, their struggles for human rights, for their struggles to become accepted like anyone else was integral with their struggle to deal with HIV. Well, well, well that uh, raises a question, Slim, for both you and, and, and Edwin, which was, is I think activists managed to change the discourse around HIV, which became described as a human rights issue, understood as a human rights issue. There was constant attention to human rights. Do you think that has happened yet with COVID-19? And do you think there's enough awareness of the centrality of human rights to effective management of, of, of COVID-19? I'll ask you that first, Slim, just very briefly to come back on that. And then, then Edwin as well, the role of activism and activists and people who've had COVID, for example, uh, uh, in, in this response. Yeah, I think when we think back to, uh, you know, the elements of what we were trying to deal with in COVID, COVID has, you know, several characteristics that make it so different. And perhaps the most important one, which I'll touch on here, is speed. Mm -hmm. And I think nowhere is it more clearer than in Neil Ferguson's analysis. So he was one of the advisors to the government to Boris Johnson. He was a member of the SAGE in the UK. And he showed in his analysis that the UK delayed its lockdown. And that he showed if the, if the UK had gone into lockdown one week earlier, they would have halved the deaths in April. So, you know, here's, 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 here's the fundamental conflict. Speed is of the essence. And how do you go with speed, but at the same time, ensure you protect people's rights? And I believe that we didn't always get it right. I would say that, that one of, for me, one of the very early issues that we grappled with, and I wasn't involved in the decision, so I'm not pointing fingers at anyone, and I'm just outlining it as, as I see it, and I've said it several times, is we didn't really know what we were dealing with. All we, all we had to work with, and hindsight is, is problematic because now we can look back and it's different. But at the time, what, was, what, 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 what did we know? We knew about people dying in Italy, trying to get into a hospital. We saw about how the patients were dying in New York. We, we just saw how this, this disease was causing mayhem. And so, mm -hmm the actions that were taken were quite substantial. I mean, just think about it for a moment. We mobilized, the government mobilized 70,000 troops. 70,000 troops. That's a lot of army soldiers to have walking around our communities. I mean, just, just to compare that, to deal with the looting and the unrest and, you know, where shopping malls were being looted by the hour, the government mobilized two and a half thousand troops. So the disproportionate approach to this very stringent uh, implementation of the lockdown, I think, you know, led us into a situation where we could have done things quite differently because mm -hmm. we could have avoided, you know, the deaths of Collins Cosa, many of the human rights abuses that we saw, because the army doesn't have the tools to really change people's behavior. They can't arrest people. They can't, so what do they do? They make them do sit-ups. Just, you know, they try to humiliate them. So we have to find a way 
And that's been a lesson for us about how to do it differently the next okay. time. Edwin, I see you nodding. <laughs> Go for it. Um, you know, as a lawyer, the fact that I agree with everything that Slim says doesn't mean that I'm not going to add something. <laughs> Good. Uh, Mark, I, I want to take a different line. I, yeah. I want to say that the AIDS activists, and Slim rightly mentioned gay men, queer men like, like I am, they revolutionized the approach to public health. President yeah. Reagan, like a certain president, uh, Thabo Mbeki, here in South Africa, disregarded the epidemic for different reasons from President Mbeki. And the gay men who were dying in their hundreds of thousands in North America uh, r rose up against the stigma, the ignorance, the hatred, the ostracism, plus the treatment slowness. They demanded that the CDC, that the National Institutes of Virology take action. And uh, Professor Anthony Fauci has paid tribute to those gay men. So they revolutionized what we expect from government when our lives are at risk. And the fact that we have uh, the, the world's largest public provided treatment program isn't only due to the government. On the contrary, if it had been only due to government, uh, we wouldn't have had one because President Mbeki refused to supply antiretroviral treatments to our people. It was because of the treatment action campaign led by Zaki Ahmad and many others that through angry, principled, well-directed, thoughtful, focused and outcome-based uh, direct action, we changed the way what we expect from doctors like Professor Karim. We changed what we expect from the pharmaceutical companies and what's happening now with the J&J &J vaccines manufactured in Kekha. No, I've said that wrongly, and I apologize to all our Tosa speaking attendants. I shouldn't have tried that without practicing it first. Manufactured here, taken out, back to vaccine oversupplied countries. It's a human rights outrage. Mm. We know that we should be outraged because those issues of equity and access and medicine affordability were put on the table by exactly. the queer act uh, uh, activists and their allies in, 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 in the 1980s and in the 1990s and 2000s in South Africa by the Treatment Action Campaign. Thank, thanks, Edwin. And, and, and do you think anything's been learned? I mean, you talk about pharmaceutical companies. I feel that they're behaving in a fashion that is even more brazen in setting rules, in behaving as if they are governments, as if they are beyond power. What have you got to say about pharmaceutical companies and what can we do? I mean. In AIDS, we were able to issue compulsory, li or we talked about compulsory licenses and parallel importation. How do we overcome this issue of, of vaccine apartheid and vaccine inequality? Slim? Perhaps I'll... Uh, okay, you start, the Slim. Issue, uh, because it's a, it's a very sore note for me. You know, when, when I think back to the early 90s, a certain young Edwin Cameron <laughs> and I and several others were sitting with Kun Slaber and a whole lot of people. We were trying to talk about in this transition to democracy, we need to prepare an HIV response. And it needed to be scientifically sound, but it needed to take all these things into consideration. Fast forward to 2000. And Mark, you and Zaki and Edward, you changed the discourse. Right? It was no longer acceptable that rich countries could get treatment when we couldn't. And that led to the Global Fund and so on. But one of the key things it did that had never been done before, because drug companies felt under threat, is they gave voluntary licenses. Mm. It changed how antiretrovirals became available because then people like Yusuf Hamid figured out a way to take three different companies' drugs, put them in one tablet and sell them for less than a dollar a day. That, that was a game changer. That game changing step came because drug companies were forced into that move. They didn't do so out of the kindness of their hearts. And that was an important lesson for us. We created the patent pool for that reason. Now, in vaccines, we don't use those things. 
We don't use the patent pool. We've got, other than one company, none of the others have voluntary licenses. They are all manufacturing directly under their own licenses. So we've got no voluntary licenses. We've got no companies, you know, trying to create this, uh, other than one exception, which I won't go into here. But, <clears throat> and of all the companies, only one has committed to cost price. Only one has committed to a no profit price. That happens to be JJ. But no other company has committed to a no profit price. And that for me is a reflection of our failure. That we didn't take the lessons of HIV and the importance of using tools, mm. new tools we created, and use them for vaccine access. And yeah. in that respect, we fell short, I felt. I think. So, so Trim, I Slim's uh, understated, well-reasoned exposition <laughs> and your uh, tone of anger and, 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 and indignation, Mark, both. Yeah, I, I begin to feel the pharmaceutical companies are running the world. I mean, the figures I see about the profits that they're making uh, out of COVID-19 uh, versus the need that still exists in many of developing uh, uh, countries. So we'll have to address this question of of, of vaccine apartheid and vaccine inequity. But I think you would both agree that it shouldn't be to the exclusion of addressing questions of care and access to care and access to treatment uh, in healthcare services. One of the things that I've picked up from talking to many doctors is that your chances of survival differ very, very much depending upon the quality of the hospital that you end up in and that many, many people have died as a consequence of getting insufficient uh, uh, quality of healthcare services. Edwin, have you got any thoughts on that aspect? Uh, you know, how do we manage, for example, the needs of people who have had long COVID going forward, who are going to need long-term access to care and treatment in a functional healthcare service? Are, are these issues that you think we should be considering? Profoundly so, Mark. Uh, I would say so. And, and when you uh, when 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 you open this evening with uh, asking us to to pause in memory of of Babita and her fight against corruption, of course that's that that's a struggle that uh, should be elemental to everyone in South Africa because we have enough resources to secure healthcare for everyone, to secure functioning public hospitals for everyone. Uh, we have enough. Doctors, it's like we have enough policemen and private security personnel uh, to to uh, to secure law and order. What has happened is that uh, we are ill-managed, we are corrupt, we are, are displacing resources, we are appropriating resources inappropriately. So I think it's an elemental struggle, Mark. And uh, without uh, this goes back to something that Professor Adam Abib wrote just a couple of weeks ago after the uh, insurrection of last month. Uh, we, we cannot secure equality and we cannot secure order without a capable state. And we have to have a capable state, a capable state, also one that removes pit latrines. Uh, yeah. you, you, you fought for Michael Kamapi and Section 27 did. We have to have a capable state that, uh, that, 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 that protects whistleblowers, that, uh, that targets uh, corrupt people and prosecutes them. So it's a long haul, Mark, but to go back to what I said earlier, there's no better place to start than now. And we can do it. We really can do it. Thanks, Edwin. And, and I think what you're saying is being affirmed by people in the chat box. Helen Rees, the chairperson of, of SAPRA, says, for COVID, it is now both vaccine and therapeutic inequity of the proven treatments for severe disease. Only dexamethasone is available. Only. That in itself is an outrage. Uh, Michelle Mehring, a, a good friend of mine, points out that we shouldn't forget access to palliative care, of which there is very little, particularly access to palliative care uh, for, for children. So building a capable health system, building a capable state, as you say, Edwin, is critically important. And this epidemic has given us a rude awakening as to why we need to accelerate uh, uh, what we're doing on, the, on, on those fronts. Slim, unless you have something to add, I want to move us now to vaccines because I see that's where the fierce discussion has been going on. 
Uh, I'm not going to entertain uh, vaccine, what I would call vaccine denialism in this discussion, just as I never entertained AIDS denialism. There's a set of, of very real uh, questions that people are, are asking. Uh, and I want us, and, and I move from the premise, not the premise, Tabo and Becky spoke like that. I move from the scientific conviction that vaccines are efficacious and that they are, that they are safe. But vaccines are beginning to pose a number of important human rights questions uh, as well. And some of those questions, Edwin, have been asked to you. Some have been asked to, to Slim. Uh, Slim, you first. Do you think vaccination should be mandatory, and uh, and and why and why not? So I think when we look at <clears throat> the uh, COVID nineteen, there's an important, very fundamental issue, and that is the relationship between personal choice and the issue of externalities. So when somebody gets COVID nineteen they're not only themselves at risk of illness, they are putting at risk every person they travel with in the taxi, in the bus, they put their work colleagues, they put their family members. So all of that, and, and much of that even before they even know that they're sick. So there is a huge externality that, is, that goes beyond personal choice in COVID-19, in that we have several settings that carry a particular risk where I believe vaccines need to be made mandatory. But I want to say that that does not mean that for religious reasons or for whatever reasons, a person cannot say that I don't want to be vaccinated. So we have to allow for those individual choices but we'll anticipate that that number will be small and we have a solution for that group. For those who do not wish to be vaccinated, that they would then have to provide a negative COVID-19 test on a regular basis, you know, weekly or twice weekly, so that we know they're not exposing others uh, to, the, to the virus. So there is an alternative. It's a more costly and more a personally more difficult alternative, but it is an alternative. Now, what am I talking about? I'll use healthcare because that's where I know, that's what I know best. Within the healthcare setting, every one of us who are involved in healthcare, whether you're a cleaner, whether you're a nurse, you're a doctor, a radiologist, doesn't matter, you are interacting with the most vulnerable in our society. They are the patients with cancer. They are the most immunocompromised. You cannot, we cannot be placing them at risk. That is just too high a risk to give to those patients of ours. So it has to be mandatory for healthcare workers, in my view. And in fact, in the US, it is now mandatory in many, many healthcare settings. And of course, the Supreme Court has already ruled on it there that in Indiana, that the hospital was right in making it mandatory. Now, there will be that issue. So are you forcing me you know, to, to do something I don't want? And you're you challenging my bodily integrity. You know, I have a right to that. And I think the answer to that is that your right to body integrity is not absolute. It has to be viewed as in relation to the challenges that that poses to highly vulnerable asterisk individuals. And in this particular instance, that if you choose not to do, not to be vaccinated, they either find you a low risk job or you come with a negative test once a week. So I want to put that, that that's, that's the setting. I don't think governments should make it compulsory. I believe it's an institutional decision or sector decision that way it needs to be made mandatory. Before I go to Edwin Slim, are there any other professions where you think that vaccination should be mandatory? I saw there was a question from Jill much earlier on about teachers, for example, and worried about a child where there was a teacher who refused to have a vaccine. Is it just healthcare workers or is it really something we'd have to assess on a profession by profession basis 
depending upon the risks they might present to other people? Yeah, I think it's not too difficult. There are two key criteria. Individuals who work in congregate settings. So that means you are forced to work in close proximity to others and often in a situation where you are compromised. So, for example, a waiter in a restaurant is putting everybody at very high risk because they're not wearing masks and they're in a congregate setting. People, you know, prison employees, uh, teachers. So all of them work in congregate settings. If you take people who attend to the public in home affairs offices, they are interacting directly with the public. They need to be protected. They need to be vaccinated. So you can make a list of of uh, professions or work environments that have to meet those kinds of criteria. And I think if you do that, you, you have a good justification for mandatory vaccinations. So now I'm going to put the very same questions to a former constitutional court judge and somebody who's steeped in law litigation over decades around rights and health. Edwin, what, do you agree with the, with the scientist or or, yeah, would you like to develop Slim's points? Well, uh, the, the scientist is more up to date on the United States Supreme Court jurisprudence <laughs> than I was. So I'm very impressed, Mark. Mark, I, I, I want to endorse everything that Slim has said, but I want to ramp it up a bit. Mm. The law is a teacher. The law is a norm, which means it embodies a standard. And when we say, let's make vaccines compulsory. We are not talking about people going from house to house with arm clamps and jabs that are going to... We're not talking about that. We are talking about creating a legal norm that says you must. Now, let me tell, tell you, you can see from the chat that there are hardcore anti-vaxxers, many of whom are very similar, Mark, as you rightly said, to the hardcore AIDS denialists. Oh, there's no HIV virus. Uh, if there is one, it's insignificant. If it is there, it's not the cause of AIDS. If it is the cause of AIDS, antiretrovirals are not the answer. Antiretrovirals are toxic. All rubbish. I'm here 24 years after starting ARVs only because of ARVs. I should have been dead uh, 24 years, less 30 months uh, uh, later. So, Mark, they're hardcore anti vaxxers and then they're the vaccine hesitant. I've got a colleague in my office whom I treasure highly, and... Why has he not been vaccinated? Well, he hasn't had a chance and he doesn't like to get jabbed. And who's going to stand in for him? The answers to all those questions, but a vaccine mandate will say to him, you should be vaccinated. What the consequences are, and I agree with Slim there, can be modulated. You can say, well, you, uh, uh, you can either impose a fine or you can impose uh, limited movement on people, or what Slim has said, and I hadn't thought of it before, which is another reason why he's a better lawyer than me. You can say, well, you're free not to be vaccinated, but you've got to, at your own at your own cost, be tested twice a week or every three days, at your own cost. Uh, so there are various ways, and of course, that will have a resource differential impact. So we can't allow the rich people to get away with with refusing vaccinations when we'll win, impose it on the poor. So, Mark, uh, we have to differentiate between the hardcore denialists. Mm. We are not going to go up to the hardcore denialists, put their arms in vices and, and, and throw needles into them. We're going to use the law as a medium of instruction, of guidance and encouragement. And we're going to say, like with seatbelts, it took years for people to accept that you've got to wear seatbelts. Now, you've got a right to bodily integrity. You've got a right if the car in which you are crashes to spill your brains against the windscreen or the seat in front of you. But what about the cost to us, the cost to public health, when you have to be taken to, 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 uh, to emergency care? That is why seatbelts were made mandatory. Everyone accepts now that seatbelts have to be, to be worn. And everyone accepts that the police can fine you. So I think that is where we should be moving, Mark. I would go further than congregate setters, I would go further. I would say that there should be a norm. And there's an excellent article. We're allowed to carry uh, blurbs for Daily Maverick because we're in a Daily Maverick platform. Uh, there's an excellent set of articles by Professor Halton Cheadle and Professor Glenda Gray, two experts uh, in Professor Slim Karim's field and my field 
outstanding people which look at this question and both of them conclude after uh, both articles conclude by these two co-authors that compulsory uh, vaccination mandates will be constitutionally permissible i certainly agree with that and also that workplace requirement of a vaccination including jill murray your question that school governing body that school principal will be entitled to say to the teacher if you don't want to be vaccinated then you you might have to lose your job that's the path that i would go to thanks a lot edwin while i'm looking for i saw a comment by josie abrahams i just wanted to to bring up but but can i ask you i mean you say that people who decline vaccination should cover the cost of their own uh, uh, tests, uh, regular tests. Would you go as far well, as I saying... I hadn't thought of that, Mark, until our learned medical professor <laughs> expert suggested it to me. Said it, I, I don't want to disclaim it as a, as a potentially daft idea, but I rather like it uh, on yeah. the face of it. No, but, but I want you to go of further. Course, that mean, introduces I... a resource discrimination, Mark, because then uh, uh, affluent people like the three of us on this uh, uh, a panel would be able to afford to do that. And we have to be careful when introducing resource differentiating penalties in the law. Well, you probably answered my, my question then, because I was going to say, should people who decline vaccination have to cover the costs of their own medical treatment if they get uh, COVID-19? And I would have motivated that partly on the grounds that we're extremely resource constrained in this country. And if you put yourself at risk, a bit like drunken driving and take up precious healthcare resources, then it shouldn't be at somebody else's uh, cost. But but the judge is not, not is a good idea, Mark. Shaking not, his not head. Not a good idea. I, Mark, that's Mark, not for me. I'm glad to hear when that. When someone falls ill with COVID, I think that we should extend all of the Hippocratic oaths, empathy uh, to them, uh, and we should not blame people. It's like saying that people who or obese or eat too much sugar we we have to use to go back to the very theme of the seminar we have to use the law in an instructive patient guiding way and we have to use uh, offer healthcare resources to those who act against their own best interests so mark that that that, that little you. autocrat inside you i think you've got to <laughs> Take it back right, 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 right now. Before uh, we, we've got eight hundred and seventy people on listening to you, I'm going to make I, you repent in front of all of them. I promise you that wasn't my view, Edwin. But I thought I'd I'd have to try it out on you, and you've well, given a very, uh, well, I think, important answer. Uh, Slim, you want to intervene? Yeah. yeah. Uh, let me just say that I actually support you in this particular instance, <laughs> and the reason I think that we need to ensure that we don't place obstacles in the path of individuals with COVID-19 in their access to medical care. So that's because that's important. Getting access to medical care saves their lives and it uh, reduces their risk of transmitting it to others. So that's important. But I think that they can. there's a good case to be made that I can make anyway, that for individuals who've not been vaccinated, they are consuming a disproportionate amount of medical resources because COVID-19 is very costly to manage, especially if you go all the way to ICU. Right? I mean, you are basically eating up the amount of money that goes into vaccinating a whole city with measles. So I think there's a case to be made that those who can afford it should be required to cover part of the cost. And it's on an affordability basis. Thanks, Slim. And, and, and what you're I'm, showing, I'm, I'm, not, you want to come back? I'm not dismayed to be in the minority here. <laughs> but, but I think that this is an issue of, that we discover all the time with law and ethics and human rights is that sometimes we need to debate the boundaries uh, in order to understand the center and what is right and wrong. And Josie Abrahams made an important point in the discussion, which was a warning about the use of law and that it needs to be balanced with public education and what in the AIDS days we called, what well, we still call treatment literacy or vaccine literacy or COVID literacy so that people understand 
uh, public health messages types of policies. I mean, I remember it takes me back to the, the days of HIV where you and I fought against mandatory HIV testing as a, uh, a condition for being employed. Will, will you just explain to people what you think is the difference between mandatory testing, unfair discrimination in HIV and fair discrimination in relation to COVID-19? Very good, Mark. The mandatory mm. testing for HIV was designed to weed out people like me. I had HIV for 11 years before I fell ill with AIDS, and I had it for 14 years before I made my public statement in 1999, the fact that I had survived AIDS because of treatment. So th those tests were designed to weed out who are you. And as HIV spread through our country after 1990, 5%, women presenting at antenatal, antenatal clinics in, in 1994. By 1999, when President Becky comes to office, that figure, Slim, remind me, your, 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 your wife is, is, is the epidemiologist, 28%, 32% in, in many urban uh, anti, uh, antenatal clinics. So, Mark, the objective was not public health oriented. The objective was to stigmatize, to ostracize, to deprive, to disprivilege, completely wrong. Here, the objective is entirely public health. The objective is to say we have to protect each other. I need to know that you've been vaccinated, that you've done the best you can, not only to protect yourself because of our limited public health resources, but to protect your students in your class, to protect your fellow employees, as Professor Grimm says, to protect those in congregate settings uh, who, who, who you have to look after. So that's the difference, Mark. That's why. And that's where... Where Professor Cheadle and Professor Gray close the second of their two articles, where they say this is the public health imperative in the workplace, which is that you have to protect not only yourself but your co-workers too. I want to and just add one. Well, can, I, can I make a joke here? There was yeah. a wonderful man, Professor Professor Ruben Scher, whom Slim will remember. Oh, I know and he was an early campaigner. Yeah. yeah, he was a brave, brave man. He opposed compulsory testing. He opposed. Uh, tattoo marks when these were suggested in 1987 and he got questions he said well a lady phoned me up and she said well my gardener he's a black man this is obviously a middle class lady in in those days in, 19, in, in the 1980s and he, he uh, uh, can I get HIV from him and Professor Scher said to her ma'am not unless you have sex with him that's different. That's the difference with, with COVID. And Professor Kareem has made that point. The speed of it. The, the, we, we don't even know how the Delta variant is. HIV was really difficult to transmit. You needed to have intimate, sustained contact with a sufficient uh, a, a reservoir viral material to be transmitted. That's not the case here. We know that it goes in microbes in the air. Terrifying. That's why we need a vaccine, vaccine mandate. And again, Edwin, tying, tying together just a second, Slim, science okay. and our knowledge with our approach in law and human rights, the two inter intimately connected in how we deal with this, Slim. Yeah, I think that I want to just add one additional dimension to our set of arguments for compulsory vaccination or mandatory vaccination in the way I described it and mandatory testing. Both of those are critical elements in our battle against COVID. And the reason I'm arguing that is because the future of the pandemic lies in the creation of new variants. And in our ability to identify new variants early and to be able to look for them, we got to test people, right? And Every person who's not vaccinated is running the higher risk of creating new variants. So it's not just there. It's not about their personal choice. It's about the whole globe. You know, when you think about it, Delta variant probably emerged in one person and then has spread through the whole world. I mean, the original strain of the, of the coronavirus came into one person and then spread into the whole world. So you are not an island and you cannot, uh, we cannot uh, allow a situation where an individual could pose that kind of threat through variance. 
And so I want to make that as a very strong argument for why we have an additional strong reason for, for both mandatory testing and uh, vaccination. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Slim. Um, the hour has run away with us. And uh, I feel frustrated because I feel as if we've just begun to scratch the surface of human rights issues. I had an overambitious plan that we would talk about children affected by COVID-19, about employment, mm. the economic dislocation, uh, many, many other aspects. And perhaps we'll return to those again at, uh, at some point in future. I hope this, this webinar has at least helped some people to understand why human rights needs to be so central uh, in our thinking, policy making, management, opera operationalization of, of responses. I'm going to give you both a couple of minutes each for closing comments. And, and, and perhaps in, in, in your closing thoughts, you'd also like to say perhaps, you know, what, what COVID-19 and human rights is teaching us for future pandemics, because I don't think COVID-19 is the last in our lifetimes. So will you help us? We we'll spend a lot of time looking back. Will you help us look forward uh, a little bit as well? I'm going to go first, I think, to you, Edwin, uh, to close off because Slim spoke a second ago, and then then I'll take Professor Abdul Karim. Edwin. Uh, what a pleasure this has been, Mark, and thank you to you and to all our, our participants for an engrossing seminar. Mark, I, I, we, we've learned many grievous lessons about the abuse of public power, about the misuse of, of force. We've learned that. We've, we, we, we've learned terrible lessons, as you, with, 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 with rightful indignation, have pointed out about uh, uh, vaccine inequity uh, and about uh, medicines availability. And we have to take those forward, Mark. Uh, I, I, uh, I think that the profound lessons we learned from AIDS have been shown to be valid in the COVID epidemic, despite the significant differences. Because of those differences, often uh, they underscore uh, uh, why human rights are, are, are important in different respects in, in, in the two settings. But Mark, I want to ask uh, Elizabeth here to ask an irrelevant question. I want to ask uh, Professor Karim whether he, he holds any credence for the lab escape theory versus the uh, a species transfer <laughs> theory. That's my interest as a vegetarian, by the way, because I think with species transfer, the, the, the reason I ask that is that I think we deal cruelly and brutally and horribly with the other sentient beings on this planet. And if the species leap is the answer, then I really think it, 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 it's a mark of reproach to the way that we mass produce animals in extremely cruel circumstances for human consumption. But let's hear what Professor Green says to that unwelcome question. Thank you, Edwin. <laughs> That's a naughty question when you've got 30 <laughs> seconds no left. Time. I'm going to ask the 807 people who are still with us to allow Slim two minutes to try and answer that question and anything else he wants to say. <laughs> and we will finish this evening's discussion by five past uh, eight. But, but uh, Professor Abdul Karim, uh, over to you. Sure, I'll try and answer <laughs> that question before I make some closing comments. So, you know, in medicine, there are no absolutes. And because there are no absolutes, it always opens the door to the possibility that there was a lab created organism. But let's look at what the likely scenario is. We have a coronavirus from bats that comes into humans through civets. Now, civets you know, look like cats, and it does so in a way that leads to a severe acute respiratory syndrome, right? SARS-1. We have a very clear understanding of the way the coronavirus went from the bats, the, the, the changes it went through in the civets, and it has to go through an intermediate host because we don't care about bat coronaviruses. They can't infect us. But the moment it goes through an intermediate host, it acquires ACE2 receptor binding. So that's important for us. And it did so in civets. We now know that 10 years later, in 2012, that MERS, another bat coronavirus, goes through camels 
and now is able to infect humans, causing a similar acute respiratory distress. So when you have a third coronavirus that we know comes from bats, because bats have very similar coronaviruses, and it has come into humans, why would we think it's anything different this time? There's a very good chance that it simply went through an intermediate host. Some say it's the pangolins. The evidence for pangolins is circumstantial, but you know we, we don't know the host. And often we only figure it out much later. So if I was a betting man, I would put, my, you know, if I had a million dollars, I would put, you know, all but one cent on it being a naturally created organism by stemming from bats, going through an intermediate host and coming into humans. So I hope that's given you some sense of you know, the history, the biology, and how these viruses work. I will just, by conclusion, I like to say that, I mean, we have learned so much from HIV that we have taken into our responses for COVID. We've also didn't take some things that we learned from HIV in the way we responded to COVID. But I think for me, I have learned something so central in COVID that I didn't really fully appreciate in the same way in HIV or in my work on TB or polio. And that is fundamentally our interdependence. Mm -hmm. The way each of us is linked to everyone else in the remotest place in Thailand or in the foothills of Chile, it doesn't matter. We are all interdependent. And so we cannot let market forces determine who gets vaccines. We cannot let supply and demand, the protection of intellectual property, define a critically important resource or a treatment will be a public good. I would add diagnostics to it too. Mm -hmm. A public good that should be distributed based on equity. Thank you. Thank you, Salim Abdul Karim, spoken like a true activist. Uh, as all great healthcare workers and scientists should be, because science is rooted in human rights. Thank you, Slim. Thank you to Justice Edwin Cameron for all of the wisdom that you've given us tonight, the thought-provoking ideas. Thank you to the 768 people who are still uh, with us on overtime. If I could just say to the 768, I make one desperate, I beg you, if you have a few rands and cents and you can support our Meals for Healthcare Workers campaign run by 702 and by the Daily Maverick, you can see at the top of the chat, there's a link that allows you to make a donation. I think we all owe an enormous debt to South Africa's healthcare workers who have taken us through three waves, who have looked after us, who have endured, I think, terrible traumas themselves witnessing loss and death and doing their best to keep us alive. So I, I would beg you if, you, if you would like to validate and show your support and show your love for, for those healthcare workers, uh, help us with this, with, with this little campaign. Uh, thank you also to Nicole Williamson, uh, who set this uh, webinar up as usual with the greatest uh, professionalism. Uh, thank you to Conrad Ador Stiftung, uh, for sponsoring it, and I hope that everybody will go out, will get vaccinated, will think about your own human rights, will think about other people's human rights, about respect, dignity, and how we continue to uh, survive and hopefully prosper again in, this, uh, in these difficult times. I hope I haven't left anybody out. Uh, good night. Thanks, Edwin, and thanks, uh, Slim, and thanks, everybody else. Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye.